If you look at the period between 2010 and 2025, this is going to be an absolutely critical period with regards to water shortages here in the United States. In the American Southwest, which is the largest growing area for population in the United States uh, these days, you're seeing major water shortages in Arizona, in California, in New Mexico, Nevada, in, uh, in Utah, and so forth. In all of these states, there are serious problems emerging, and it's the fastest growing area of the, of the country. When you look, go into the American Midwest, the Farm Belt area, which has so long uh, depended upon the Ogallala Aquifer, which is the largest aquifer on the, on the, con on the continent, that aquifer is being drained at a rate of 14 <coughs> times the ability of nature to replenish it. So it won't be long before there will be very little water in, 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 the, in that aquifer. Add to that climate change and the, and the impacts of global warming uh, that are fully expected with regards to the prairies, the bringing back of droughts into the prairies of both Canada and the United States, and we will find, I think, further serious problems emerging on that front. If we go up and down the East Coast uh, in, in Florida right now, uh, a lot of the fresh water is being contaminated by, by seawater. I mean, seawater is seeping into the freshwater systems. If we go further up and see in the case of Georgia, in the case of, uh, of uh, Arkansas and Alabama, up through Mississippi, up through uh, the Carolinas, and into Tennessee, in all of these states, there are growing water shortage problems, and, and we are seeing this intensify at a, at a great rate. 35% of all American cities, large, medium, and small, will be facing crucial crisis points in terms of water availability and water shortages. That's by 2025. These were based on some very real facts in terms of what was happening in global trade agreements. If you looked at the uh, General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, there was a broad definition of water. Water was held to be tradable because even water in its na natural state, water in its artificial state, water in its aerial state, in other words, all forms of water were really subject to, uh, to, to, to trade agreements. And when I say that all forms of water, and we're talking about even groundwater, was capable of being something that could be monetarily valued, and at the same time could be put into motion in terms of a commercial transaction. Now most of us think of water as part of the commons still today. I think in most of our countries, we don't see it so much as a part of a commercial transaction. Uh, but, uh, but that's precisely what, uh, what the definition of a tradable commodity would be. And the, and, uh, the concern was that NAFTA would open the floodgates uh, for massive water, bulk water exports from Canada to the United States. To offset this, the Canadian government, the Prime Minister at the time, Mulroney, called for a communique between the three leaders, between Mulroney, Bush Sr. at the time, and, um, and Salinas. That uh, the, any water that would had entered into a, in, had not entered into commerce or become a product would not be subject to the NAFTA rules. In other words, they were trying to make sure that people did not feel that any water that had not entered into commerce or become a product would not be subject to NAFTA rules. After NAFTA was ratified, however, in 1994, started working with a number of legal experts and in the process of doing so, we began to see what was really in NAFTA and how it applied to water. And I just want to walk through three of those lessons. Lesson number one was that uh, water was definitely understood to be a tradable good, a tradable commodity, but it was even different in NAFTA than the, the original GATT. If you look at the original GATT, it says if a water is a tradable commodity, uh, then you can't put a ban or a quota on it for export. Uh, but if under in, for environmental reasons, you can invoke Article 20 of the GATT and you can actually uh, put a tax or a levy or a duty on it 
in order to be able to bring about conservation measures. Under NAFTA is that all of these rights to bring in those environmental measures for conservation purposes were for all intents and, pur were for all intents and purposes surrendered. They were surrendered under, under Article 302, under Article 309.2, and under Article 314. Furthermore, under NAFTA Article 315, uh, this was the proportional sharing clause that, uh, that Canada, in, in any of its natural resources, trading with the United States, would have to maintain, uh, uh, would have to provide a proportional share, in other words, of its water in per perpetuity. Once the tap is turned on, it stays on. That's the principle in NAFTA, the proportional sharing agreement. Secondly, under NAFTA, water was understood to be a service. And I think we've talked a fair amount about the fact that uh, under these free trade agreements, services were added in addition to goods. And so it wasn't just that water was a good, but water is a service. And uh, by that means, all forms of water services were, were to be considered. Under Chapter 12 of NAFTA, which contains a set of rules governing cross-border trade in services, what we see is services that pertaining to the production, distribution, marketing, sales, and delivery of all kinds of goods, including water. And what happened then was that, uh, that under the National Treatment Clause that is uh, woven into, the, uh, into NAFTA, this meant that uh, uh, big, large uh, for, uh, water service, private water service corporations that are engaged in the privatization of water services like Suez and Viola would, through their U.S. subsidiaries, be able to have direct access to our, to our public services and water services in Canada and the same in Mexico as well as in the United States. <clears throat> so this definitely was a move in the direction under the National Treatment Clause and particularly under Articles 1202 and 1204 to be able to further accelerate and encourage the, the, the privatization of, of water services and the deregulation of water services. Thirdly, water was seen as a, an investment. And by that I mean is that when we look at water as a good and as a service and we involve transnational corporations, we're talking about investment rights. And the objective of NAFTA was to, to accelerate uh, the free trade agreements to be able to protect the rights of investors and the rights of corporations. And so not only do we have the National Treatment Clause that gave uh, uh, foreign-based corporations uh, the same access to water withdrawals as domestic companies, but we also had uh, the, the, the provision built in called investor state mechanisms that allowed corporations to sue governments directly for alleged violation of the NAFTA rules. And therefore, uh, if you look at, uh, add to this, the uh, Article 1110, which goes on to talk about expropriation, provides a very broad definition of expropriation, and uh, therefore allows corporations to make, to sue governments, uh, and to call for, and to claim compensation, uh, substantial compensation, based upon the expropriation of those investment, uh, in, in, in the, of, of a particular investment. Civil society organizations in all of our countries need to unite around a common platform. And that among other things, this common platform should call for the removal of water as a tradable good, service, and investment under NAFTA. And by the way, if uh, that gets rejected, there's always the abrogation clause we get of getting out of NAFTA. Let's not forget that. And then, on the basis of that, we need to further strengthen this platform and fortify it with three other measures. One, in every one of the NAFTA countries, it is absolutely crucial to develop a comprehensive national water policy in all three countries that is based upon water conservation, water quality, and water equity. Number two, the development and enactment of national legislation 
prohibiting bulk water exports on environmental grounds. And when we say environmental grounds, and that is that bulk water exports from one, a water rich to a water poor area create massive environmental problems in the area from whence the water, from where the water was taken in the first place. The third point would be the creation of tri-national institutions modeled after the Boundary Waters Treaty and the joint International Joint uh, Commission, which governs the Great Lakes, to build the, to create these tri-national institutions for the purpose of governing transboundary waters between all three countries based again on environmental priorities. We have institutional models in place. 